people. So going back to Daphne's Island, this is actually, so my auntie Charlotte um, on Kauai, she works at Smith Family Luau, and she does all the costumes there, and they have a man-made lake where there's a little island for each type of person that immigrated to Hawaii, and this is the sign for Japanese Island. And when I took the picture years ago, I, you know, just thought it was really funny, but, you know, in a way, I'm always going to be looking at a sign like this. Sometimes I've made it, sometimes I'm showing it to other people, sometimes someone else is putting that label onto me, but um, it's complicated. Legacy and identity is complicated, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to carry it, and I'm just going to own it, and I'm going to embrace it. So I'm going to take us to the 70s, and I'm going to take us to the 1980s. Um, my name is Laura Kina, and um, this is a picture of my family, probably, I think, around 1987. So I don't know if any of you remember Mark and Mindy, oh, yeah. suspenders there, McDonald's kids. Um, so the main thing, I I'm going to share with you some artwork, just as Emily did as well. Uh, but to think about the word hapa as an adjective versus a noun. Um, when I was growing up, um, my family is originally from Hawaii, from the big island of Hawaii, from Hilo, from a little town called Pianoa. Um, but I wasn't born there. I was born in California and grew up in the Pacific Northwest in a town called Paulsbo. But Hapa Haole, um, Hapa wasn't a bad word. It wasn't um, a sole identity either. It was like a way to, to reference quickly, oh yeah, yeah, they're Hapa Haole, yeah? And, or yeah, she's Hapa, no? But it wasn't, I wouldn't say I am Hapa, <laughs> I would say, I'm half Okinawa, and I'm uh, Spanish, Basque, French, English, Irish, Dutch, and I would own all of that. Um, and it's really important to know, too, I think I grew up in the Sesame Street multiculturalism kind of generation where it wasn't anything to be ashamed of, even though I've experienced terrible racism, you know, but you know what? It's a problem. It's not mine, and I just let it, you know, they're the ones who are crazy. <laughs> Um, but I think I was able to have that reaction, although not at first always, and those things happen and are very hurtful. Um, because my dad came from a culture where it wasn't that big of a deal to be mixed race. Uh, so my family came to Hawaii from Okinawa. <laughs> this, there's a lot of parallels between Emily and my own biography. Uh, around the early 1900s to work as sugarcane uh, plantation workers in Hilo, Hawaii. Now my family, her mother was from uh, California, Spanish Basque grew up Spanish-speaking in Vallejo, California, and then married a, um, a man who was from Waco, Texas, originally from the Deep South. So I have, I'm related to James Knox Polk, um, you know, <laughs> my, you know, on my grandfather's side, they go way back to the French mercenaries who came over um, to fight originally in the founding of the United States. So I'm very, very much an all-American sort of uh, story in terms of uh, my background. And I grew up in a little town called Paulsbo. Has anybody been up there? Have a little great bread. <laughs> Slice, this isn't Sly's Bakery, but I like that mural there. And, um, you know, we were pretty assimilated. I didn't speak Japanese growing up, but my grandmother lived in the house with us, so we had pigeon, you know, and we always ate spam sushi and different <laughs> types of things. And I proudly brought that to my classmates, and they're like, oh! <laughs> right? Eventually, um, you know, you get tired of a small town, and I was rebellious and wanted to leave, so I went off to Chicago to go to art school. And then, um, much to my parents' dismay, I converted from fundamentalist Christianity to Judaism. And so then this is another photograph of my father at my daughter's Brit Bot. So um, that's my you know, background. So to talk a bit, a bit about my artwork, um, originally I really kind of came of age as an artist in, in the Asian American arts, and that's still how very much how I identify. But after the 2000 census, when, you know, that's the census that were the first time people were allowed to self-enumerate more than one race. I started to see the identity of, of Hapanis evolve across the country. I knew this identity was happening on the West Coast more, but in the Midwest, if you ask somebody that, they're like, what? <laughs> um, so around uh, 2002, I started a series called Hapa Soap Operas. And this, <laughs> this is a portrait of a guy named Paul Yamada, who's quite a bit older than myself. So he's in his late 50s, maybe early 60s by now. Um, and his experience of, of growing up um, German and 
I, I guess he's actually uh, Bohemian and Japanese in Minneapolis is very different than mine, and he was bitter. <laughs> and as I started to meet more and more people across the country from different regions, different age groups, I realized we all have very different stories. It's pretty interesting. So first I would photograph the people, and then these were large-scale oil paintings that I would do of them. And um, then I ended up knowing a lot of these people over the years, so they become part of my life. I'll just show you a few of, a few of these images here from the Hopple Soap Opera series. So originally painting friends and family, and then um, this process of oil painting takes a long time. <laughs> so it's not like just like a photograph. You end up getting to know people for a while, and um, it's been interesting, the process of building community through the process of making art. The top person there, uh, Robert Karimi with the hat on, he's a really great performance artist from the Bay Area. You know him? He's um, Iranian and Guatemalan. Yeah. <laughs> and I met him through Asian American arts. So. Then um, after a certain point though, and then while I was doing those, for those of you that have seen Kip Fulbeck's show across the street, I also was photographed by Kip, and it was interesting to see another artist working with those similar ideas at, at that time. Um, I quickly though became aware of, well, but what about people who aren't Asian white, right? <laughs> why is, I mean, not duh, why is the experience so different people for people who are double dual minorities? And, and some people, you know, it's a very different experience. So I needed to sort of expand how I was thinking about this in my work. So this series I'm going to show you here is called Loving that I did in six. And I did them initially as sketches to make paintings, right? I was, this is sort of a technical thing, but I felt I was too beholden to the, the photograph in my oil painting, so I thought I'd loosen up by doing some charcoal sketches. But then I liked the sketches better than the paintings. There was something really free about them. And it really occurred to me, too, that in this country, race is defined in terms of black and white. And what I liked about charcoal is it's a preparatory medium that's not meant to be something per permanent, and it can easily blow away. So here's a portrait of a woman named Shoshana Weinberger. It's also a good friend. She's Jamaican and Jewish. And uh, you see her owning the zebra print, right? So a term that she grew up with, derogatory, being called a zebra head. She's like, I'm going to wear zebra print all the time. <laughs> and she's very proud of that. But she's got her eyes closed, and she's looking inside, not le letting us look at her. Um, one of the things, by the time I did this series, I was also, that's right when Kip Fulbeck's book, uh, Part Asian 100% Hapa, was just hitting the bookstores. So I was also thinking about that format of the ethnographic portrait, of the headshot, and I wanted that full bust. I wanted how these pictures need to relate in, in terms of each other, um, and how a viewer, I wanted them clothed. <laughs> I wanted the people to be presented in a way that would explain who they are through their tattoos. So here's a person, Scooter LaForge, who you wouldn't know on the surface that he's Latino, right? He may pass as, you know, white, but what, how does, how do, you know, biracial issues or mixed race issues within other communities of color, and how, how do people engage these things? Not just looking at, at it through um, one lens. Community, mm -hmm. yeah, this is Danny Pudi. Yeah, he is Indian and Polish. <laughs> and I met him through Second City, he was doing this great show called Coconut, and he got up on stage and he's like, you wanna hear a Polish joke? And then he can speak fluent, fluent Polish. <laughs> so, um, but you know, at a certain point, there was also things I felt I could not answer through artwork. So at this time, um, I started working on a book project that it will come out in 2013 called <laughs> War Baby Love Child: Mixed Race Asian American Art. To kind of look at the larger history of um, what you know, of both of art and also mixed mixed race Asian um, identity, and also helping to found the uh, Critical Mixed Race Studies Conference. Um, to answer questions that went beyond maybe what I was discovering in my own work. Now, quickly to show you two more bodies of work. I live in a neighborhood that's um, South Asian and Orthodox Jewish. So it's primarily, right now it's mostly Pakistanis who live there, but um, just a few years back it was mostly Indian. And in my husband's, uh, when he was growing up, it was all Orthodox Jewish. So we've returned back to the place where his family was from. Um, so the street signs you see around you, it's this cacophony of things. So it, it did occur to me too, it's a little strange to always be looking in the distant past when something right outside my door is pretty exciting <laughs> and unique. Um, it's also disappearing really fast because of gentrification and the economy. So combining thinking about that, thinking about my father uh, returning back to Hawaii here at a union and one of my brothers relocating back to Hawaii and becoming very much, um, he, he just joined the Hawaii Air National Guard, so you can't really, you know, he's very, we're, we're again becoming, um, part of that again. And I also was really thinking too about uh, what did my great-grandparents wear while they worked in the cane fields? I got very interested in textile history. 
cutting a very long story and condensing it here. So this is a body of work called Devon Avenue Sampler, which takes you to the name of the street that I live on, Devon Avenue. And here I've stitched together all these different fabrics so that they have the general sort of appearance of what you would see the Okinawan and Japanese farmers wearing. Um, but it's presented in like a borrow quilt kind of format and I've hand painted on these, all these different street signs. In another part of the series, I sent uh, my designs out to a fair trade women's organization in Mumbai, and I had them do the embroidery on this. There's that, I'm gonna show you a real close up so you can see how detailed the running stitches are on these. And then I took the work and showed it throughout to three different places in India, and I showed these alongside for Indian artists, and we're both exploring themes of indigo. And then we brought the works uh, to the US to different venues, and so that's traveling as well. And lastly, uh, this is my most recent body of work, um, it's called Sugar, and so now I'm going way back <laughs> to the you know early 1900s here, and I think very similar to Emily, I'm, I'm thinking about obake, <laughs> about ghost stories and ancestors, but to know who you are as an individual, you can't know who you are until you know your ancestors. And so this is not just about identity, me, 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 but it's about their present with me in the moment. Uh, so I, I went back to Hawaii with my father and gathered a lot of oral history talk story with elders, and uh, did all this body work last, last summer. Oban, right? <laughs> Cane fires. I'll leave you last to hear this one with Palaka. Um, and that helped, you know, the, through those uh, talking story, then I, I created these works and I'm, I'm continuing to make that work. So I think, you know, where I'm at today is I'm really exploring my Okinawan identity and, and uh, you know, what does it mean to be part of, you know, to be in Chinanshu, to be part of the Okinawan diaspora. And I was recently asked to serve on a, uh, the Japanese American Service Committee's board in Chicago. And I've always been part of pan-Asian things, but what does it mean for me to enter into a space that was always closed to me before? You know, one, I'm, I'm only half, and am I really Japanese? And I'm not from Chicago, and I didn't, uh, my family wasn't interned, that wasn't our narrative. So they've asked me to be part of these, so here I am an adult, <laughs> you know, exploring, what does this mean? Well, being part of a community means money, <laughs> right? You pay your board dues, but you also show up to events, right? And uh, it's also, I want to show, leave you with this picture of work here because it's not a passive thing that just happens to you. You know, it's uh, last week I was at Okinawan picnic, Saturday I'm going to go to another big Nikkei picnic and uh, volunteer at a festival. And so being part of a community actually means participating. It doesn't just happens to me. <laughs> so I'll just leave you with that. Um, I read this great quote earlier of, uh, from Ming Dariotis, um, who said that, um, he was actually talking about um, uh, the Hobbit and the Ring of Power, and said that my Ring of Power was, um, f for me, the, my Ring of Power was the word Hoppa. And um, that uh, up, until, up until hearing the word Hoppa, when people said, what are you? I had to answer Chinese, Greek, Swedish, English, Scottish, German, Pennsylvania, Dutch. Um, I started to realize that heritage does not equal identity, which I, th I think is a really, really interesting uh, piece. And that so instead of worrying um, you know, about community, and so when you were talking about community, I think it was really interesting, um, instead of worrying about where am I gonna find another Chinese, Greek, Swedish, English, Scottish, German, Pennsylvania, Dutch, American community, I realized I already had a Hapa community. But in uh, some of the emails going back and forth on this, um, Dee May brought up that the, the, the word Hapa is for her, you don't necessarily um, identify with it. And I'm wondering if, if you can really talk about the word and can we talk about uh, all of you, talk about the word is, is it an empowering word or is it a reductive term? Well, I think you, since you're from Hawaii, I think you should talk about well, it. Well, I'm from Seattle, well, <laughs> really. But you're from Seattle. <laughs> no, I think I, I looked, I, actually, Wei Ming, Dariotis, and myself are co-authoring yeah. the book and creating the show together. Um, in the knew. Hawaiian uh, dictionary, Hapa's literally means half. Uh, Kip Fulbeck has a different e uh, explanation that he has up in the show there, but um, literally just means half. And so I think many of us earlier in the Pano 
group we were talking about it can mean different things in different mm -hmm. places. But I think when it changes to be something with a capital H is where it's a standalone identity. And um, there is, a, you know, discussion, you know, the anxiety of is this an appropriation of Hawaiian uh, language um, and a recolonization? That's, that's a conversation going on. So Wei Ming has written about um, wanting to not use that word anymore because it could harm other people. So what's, what's your, like, <laughs> go well, on. I, I just think that it, it again, comes to that uh, theme of fluidity. How do you feel on a certain day for me? And do I even want to, I, you know, I make an active decision quite often whether or not I'm going to choose tell people I am mixed race or half or bisexual, biracial, bi, you know, and, and multi, you know, multiracial. So it's an active decision for me. So hapa by itself isn't enough, but for me it, it's always something fun to say as opposed to my sole identifier. good conversations while we were doing that. Um, <laughs> now that I live in the Midwest, though, um, in a way, I've changed my opinion of who I am in, in certain ways. I think living in Seattle, I didn't have to think about what Hapa was. I just, that, that was the term that was used to describe somebody who had a, you know, a mixed background. I don't I've nobody even meet and since met. So um, really trying to figure out um, how to describe yourself. The, the Hapa question, I think, is a, it's almost like a, a, a little a micro uh, description in the whole discourse of mixed race studies and culture. And you know, here in Portland, we can have a very different conversation than what we would have in Chicago or Ohio mm -hmm. or in New York City or so what are your thoughts on the Gifobox exhibition? I mean, I think we can, we're all among friends and we can talk about the way that. But we're being recorded. We We still live in a transparent society. <laughs> what, what are our thoughts about? Yeah, I mean, and really, as you said, it, you know, it differs from how, how Kip defines Hapa and you actually made mm -hmm. the distinction between the noun and the adjective or, you yeah. know, the noun and the infinitive. Yeah. Or well, I got to, was a subject in his series as well on page 50. Um, so I talked about this <laughs> earlier, but Take, write that down. <laughs> I had longer hair, it was a long time ago, <laughs> but I do want to tell one funny story about that. It's, um, I remember being really cranky that day and taking off from work and just wanting to go do something like for me that day, um, and normally don't get like that. So I go to Kip's lecture that was at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and a student at the time, their undergrad, uh, had organized bringing him in, and he pulled me aside and he's like, if you really want to get in Kip's book, write something like really, f so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll just think of something and I'll uh, write something. And so, you know, there's a long line of people waiting to get their photograph taken, and you go in this room and there's the lighting equipment, and you sit down, he asks you to take off your shirt, you put a towel, and then boom, picture's taken. At the moment he's like taking the picture, I realized, why am I so crabby? I realized I was pregnant. So <laughs> this, his work for me has like this one personal meaning, because that very moment that picture is taken, I realized, <laughs> so uh, it's on one level, there's that. Now my daughter's six, so to kind of put some perspective. Um, but it was, I think some people mentioned this earlier, um, it was very empowering and exciting to see something that I really thought was just, you know, I, I knew a lot of other mixed Asians within Asian American art circle. It seemed like more and more <laughs> the people who were part of the world of Asian American Asian were also multiracial. Um, but then to have that kind of blow up across the nation for people to be able to talk about it and have a discourse is really exciting. And I think it, his book has meant a lot for people who are isolated in places where they meet somebody else to come across that um, and realize they're, they're not alone. So I think it's been, it's been was a really, played a really important role in raising awareness in that sense. Molly, any thoughts? Um, I, I think his work functions on, on a variety of levels. I, the majority of the time, I think it's, it's taken at face value. People look at the, the characteristics of those that are photographed and what they write. But I think um, 
I, I think we've, we've talked about this a little bit. I, I think that there are things that he's doing that um, are have a, an aesthetic and cultural history as far as por formal portraiture. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a Western aesthetic, right? Headshot, you know, kind of thing. Um, when you look at images of slaves that were photographed where, oh, you know, if you have this kind of nose, you can tell they're this kind of person. That's why they're not as smart, just because their brain is measured here. It's, it's done in the exact same manner. Um, it, the label, you know, is underneath with the text. It's very anthropological. I mean, I think that there are some, he's using a model, and it, the work is much more complex than the discourse is typically when people talk about his work. I think it's fantastic that it's out there because there was nothing like that when mm -hmm. I was growing up. There was nowhere I could go where I could say, oh, you know, I think it's very inspirational, but but I'm really, I appreciate the deeper, if you want to go in and really critically analyze it and see, you know, well, that was taken. This star was started in, in the early 2000s, and where have, where have race and mixed race discourse gone since then? And would he do that project differently now? Would he use other kinds of historical models? I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's is, do you do you think that the the, the sort of anthropological um, you know typology that he, is, was that a, is that a critical choice that he was making or do you think that's a self, an, an an un self conscious choice? I have no idea. I don't know. I've interviewed him about yeah. it, and um, it's not something he'll he's in at least in my interview he addressed directly. He really likes. Uh, he's talked about his like family history and the reaction that he's gotten in terms of. Um, you know, people seeing that it's really important and building a community. Mm -hmm. So, so Dima, you interviewed Kip the other day, well, right? Well, yeah, I, I think he he thought it was a fun way to uh, to open up, and uh, mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the popularity of it is that it, it it's almost playful and whimsical, like a, you know, a lot of his work, because I think that gives an entry point for people to be able to discuss it to open up a dialogue. Uh, often, you know, I know as either a playwright or a radio producer or a writer, um, you say I'm doing, you know, eight hours on Asian American history, which I did, called Crossing East. People automatically would say, oh no, you're gonna tell all these horrible stories about how white people, you know, oppressed, you know, all <laughs> Asians throughout throughout America's history. And, well, yeah, that's it too, but, <laughs> but they're also personal stories, you know? And there's a certain stigma anytime you do anything that is racially based, you know, or multiculturally based that um, people put up a wall to. And I think what the Hoppe exhibit does is that it opens it up so that people can, if they want to explore it on a deeper level, open it up for discussion. My concern though is that it doesn't, you know? and. Before I met, you know, well, not met, but saw the exhibit and also uh, talked with Kip, I saw the uh, news uh, features done on MSNBC and CNN, and it was done in a very superficial kind of way as to everybody's going to be called Hapa now, you know, and this is how this is how we can all address mixed race in this country. The exhibit that'll do it, and that's the end of the, the discussion. So. I just felt that a lot from the way it's being portrayed sometimes. And we have to keep in mind it was 2007, right? Or 2006, actually, wasn't mm -hmm. it, that he did this project? So, you know, things change. They keep changing, and the dialogue has to keep changing. So I, I love the exhibit. What I love most is, I didn't realize it was anthropological, but I love the comments, you know, that everybody wrote handwritten. I, that's what I really love the most. I loved what they said, and it was also interesting when I talked to Kip that, you know, I said, well, it seemed like the women went deeper in their comments, right? And he said, well, men don't like to talk about anything, right? <laughs> so it was hard to get them to, to write anything that, you know, that was, that wasn't, uh, that was too personal. So, and that's, that's across the board, I think, in, in America anyway. So I don't think it's just, you know, Hoppe men <laughs> who don't want to talk about but yeah, that's I would I would like it to be on a deeper level. So if we wanted to discuss it, that'd be great. Um, you know what people got out of it. But again, it's uh, it's only one. You know, here's this, these great projects that you can all mm -hmm. explore. Um, I think there needs to be more and more, not just one.
Yeah, I think that's what's so important. As, as you were talking earlier today, you know, Valerie has different people. Uh, Papa is not uh, a homogeneous <laughs> term, right? <laughs> so there, there needs to be many, many definitions um, and many different projects and the work of, of everyone, you know, in this room are important in that discussion. And there are groups that take Hapa who are, you know, it isn't just Asian. There are groups that consider Hapa of, of many races too that embrace that. And some, some Hapa groups don't want it to be other than just Asian. So nobody thinks you know, u universally, it's, it, everybody's going to have an opinion that's different. Um, so, Naraka always says that um, all art is political. Um, and I don't think that most people who see the show would probably think of it as a political show, but I think that there has to, there's an element of making, of making the personal political. And I think that all of your work, in many ways, even if it's not overtly political, I'm, I'm guessing that there is some political subtext. Would, would, would that be a good assumption? Yes. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you can really kind of talk about, is there, um, in terms of sort of restorative justice, restorative justice angle, is there, a, is there a confronting history or confronting colonialism aspect or um, um, are y is, there, is, there a, is there a conversation with a, with a larger audience you're trying to have through the work? Jump in, I anyone. I think so. Yeah. I think w when I go into the studio, those are not, that's not what I say. I say, I'm investigating the color blue. Or I say, I found this really cool image. Or all of a sudden, it, a lot of, for me, a lot of times titles will pop in my head. If I let myself go blank, then something will land in my head. And I know what I'm going to do. And <laughs> it's, but, but they all sort of have a through line of being rooted in history and autobiography. But then how does that extend out to a larger conversation? And I'm interested in um, representation of history and people's and how they interconnect and sort of the slipperiness of identity. Those are always themes in my work. And um, I think those are inherently political of who gets to represent and what gets represented and where it gets represented. And then who buys it? And then who writes about it? And all the networks surrounding of production. <laughs> so Emily, I like that you, you actually referred to the, the notion of archeology span in your work. And I think that that's a, 